Last week I told you all about what the G.I. Joe franchise means to me. Today I want to take a look at what it means to the world. But before I jump into that, I just want to explain something real quick. I very much want this channel to be consistent, so for the time being, I'm going to try out a bit of a formula. The idea is that for each of the franchises that I love the most, I will bring you three videos. The first will be a fluffy, sentimental retelling of my experience with the franchise and why I love it. The second one, or this one for G.I. Joe, will be an analytical look at the franchise itself and why it holds so much appeal. And the third will be a critical review after reliving the franchise to put my own opinions to the test. So let's get to the matter at hand. What makes G.I. Joe so great? To answer that, we're going to have to dissect this franchise and see if we can figure it out, and we're better to start than at the very beginning. Fun fact, G.I. Joe came to be because Barbie was selling really well and Hasbro wanted to create a line of dolls that would appeal to little boys. Another fun fact, Hasbro soon realized that the word doll wouldn't appeal to little boys and so they penned the term action figure to market their G.I. Joe figurines. So the first G.I. Joe hit shelves in 1964. It was molded to be as realistic as possible and, naturally, modeled after soldiers. Its success was brief and it was soon redesigned. See, in 1970, because of increasing opposition to the war, audiences weren't too pleased with the idea of glorifying soldiers, so G.I. Joe was rebranded from America's movable fighting man to the Adventure Team in the hopes that it would garner more favorable reception and continue to sell, of course. Again, its success was relatively short-lived, and the toy line ended in 1976. It was followed by a string of technically unsuccessful toy lines that don't really have much bearing on the G.I. Joe franchise as a whole. So, the G.I. Joe franchise really came to life in 1982, when once again it was rebranded as a real American hero. The toys and the franchise as a whole became what we know it today because of a very important collaboration, one between two giants, Hasbro and Marvel. There is one legend, although it's disputed, that the CEO of Hasbro and the CEO of Marvel met in the loo at a charity function and got to chatting. The CEO of Hasbro mentioned that he wanted to bring G.I. Joe back, and so the president of Marvel offered a helping hand with their team of writers that could breathe new life into the franchise. The best way to bring the franchise back was to give it a story. Doing so would also bypass the advertising laws of the time. Ads for toys, for some unknown reason, were heavily controlled, but literature, including comic books, had no regulation at all. And so, the proposition stood as such. Advertise the coinciding comic books, and fans will rush to buy the merchandise. On the other hand, fans of the toy lines will rush to get the coinciding comic books. If this legend is true, give that man a medal, please. From there, G.I. Joe became what is familiar to us now. It was no longer a simple toy line aimed at young boys. It was a full franchise with a cast of characters and a story that everybody could take interest in. And in my humble opinion, this was the most significant move from toys to immortal media franchise. The second important milestone came with its spin-off media. It began with the original animated series, which to this day is regarded as the most iconic of all the G.I. Joe properties. The series was aimed at the young ones and punted the idea of doing and being good. Each episode had a moral takeaway or life lesson, and the show played directly into the good versus evil trope that people love so much. The good guys, the G.I. Joes, were uncompromisingly good and the bad guys were bad guys because they had to be bad guys. Now, I could be totally wrong about this. Go ahead and discuss this in the comments. But I have a theory that G.I. Joe took the world by storm because it was different from all of the other stories that played to this trope. Hear me out. 
G.I. Joe was basically the world's first mainstream, mass-appealing, non-propaganda representation of good guys with guns. Not lightsabers, not starships, not magic wands or staves, not teleporting red shoes or fairy godmothers or superpowers. Just guns and tanks and good old mean military machines. Are we really asking why G.I. Joe became as popular as it was, though? Like, like, come on. Really? <laughs> Sure, there were other stories that followed this, for example, James Bond, but James Bond is an asshole. Or you have something like the A-Team that followed a team of wrongly convicted former soldiers who were operating from the underground and trying to prove their innocence while they fought for the side of good. G.I. Joe was aimed at kids, so it emphasized being a goody two-shoes. It promoted the idea of lawful good. The Joe team had a moral code to uphold. And they did. With guns, and tanks, and good old mean military machines. But this leads me to my next point, which is that the characters were just really, really cool. G.I. Joe was way, way ahead of its time in terms of diversity. The first black G.I. Joe hit shelves in 1965, only a year after the entire franchise first launched. He was also one of the first and only mainstream toys aimed directly at little African-American boys. Sure, he was simply just a white model painted brown, and maybe in retrospect that might be a little bit offensive to some, maybe they could have produced it a little bit better and been more aware of what they were doing, but what we have to appreciate here is that this was in 1965. The fact that this black G.I. Joe even existed so soon after the franchise that was aimed predominantly at white people, the fact that he even existed in the first place and wasn't a cruel caricature of black people, is noteworthy and Hasbro does deserve a little bit of respect because of that. Then there's Spirit, the first Native American G.I. Joe who debuted in 1984. Technically, he did start out as a bit of a cliché and a stereotype, but he was redesigned for the Devil's Due comic book run to correct their ignorance and everything that made him offensive. Then there's Scarlet, the first female G.I. Joe, who hit shelves in 1982, and she wasn't a skirt. She was a martial arts expert and a well-respected member of the G.I. Joe team, and to this day she's one of the most prominent and most loved characters of them all. Much later, in 2017, IDW, the publisher of the G.I. Joe comic books, hired a gay artist to sort of reimagine some of their characters. The resulting alternate cover for G.I. Joe number 7 was met with quite a bit of controversy because the Dreadnoughts, an overtly masculine macho gang, were portrayed in quote-unquote homoerotic positions, and they were kind of sort of wearing what could be considered gay fashion. It seems there wasn't even any real reason for this, they just kind of felt like breaking the hyper-masculinity of the franchise as a whole. So they did that. Not to mention both Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. The writer of the G.I. Joe comic books, Larry Hammer, went on record to say that he always wanted Snake Eyes to be Asian. It's unclear, but it is believed that pressure from the publishers and audiences led them to ultimately create Snake Eyes as a blonde American man. But Larry Hammer has also said that he was uncomfortable with the only Asian character, Storm Shadow, being a bad guy, and that is why Storm Shadow eventually went on to join the Joe team, because he wanted to realign Storm Shadow to have more positive representation for Asian people. So it's safe to say that G.I. Joe was woke before you were, but it's not just the diversity of the characters that stands out, it's the variety as well. There's Duke, the extremely intelligent, multilingual, nerdy, obedient, and fair second-in-command with all the qualities of a leader and an all-American face to match. But there's also Cobra Commander, a villain created to be pure evil. Cobra Commander doesn't have any moral motivation. He just wants to destabilize the world's power structure so that he can seize control of all of its wealth and government because he can and because he's a shitty person with a lot of power. 
and also his hellbent on wreaking havoc. Then there are the relationship dynamics between Snake Eyes and Scarlet, and also Destro and the Baroness. And then there's also the fact that the lines of allegiance are frequently blurred in this franchise. Firefly started out on the Joe team and went off to Cobra like a bloody traitor. As I said, Storm Shadow started off with Cobra, but reshifted his allegiance to the Joe team, and Destro has always sort of been in between. He is definitely with Cobra, but he has joined forces with the Joe team when necessary, and even went as far as to befriend some of them genuinely befriend some of them. <laughs> and then there's General Hawk, the leader who really does do his best, but also becomes bitter and hateful after he is injured and left paralyzed in a shootout with Cobra. And yes, some might argue that that was unkind to the disabled community, and maybe it's not my place to speak on this at all, but I really do feel like they did that to show that even General Hawk is only human. And also, he continued to be a great leader even after his injury and his struggle with himself. Also, to take it back to the representation a little bit, both General Hawk and Snake Eyes count in this. Like I said, General Hawk was left paralyzed at one point, and Snake Eyes, after a horrible helicopter crash, was left disfigured and mute. And yet, he still got one of the greatest romantic plot points of all time, and is probably arguably the most well-loved G.I. Joe character of them all. My point is that each G.I. Joe character is truly distinct. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say that the only thing these characters have in common is their job. So earlier I said that the collaboration with Marvel is what truly immortalized the G.I. Joe franchise, and this is what I meant. It began as a simple toy line for little boys, but once it was given a cast of characters and a plot that people could follow, which then went on to spark a TV series and a whole bunch of other media, that was when people truly became invested in it. But this leads me to the most important question of all. How and why is a franchise that was set up for success in literally every single way utterly and entirely and continuously failing to meet critical acclaim in absolutely everything that it tries. Sigma Six was an excellent series that I lived for when I was in high school, but it didn't really do that well, got cancelled, and now lays forgotten. Renegades did fairly well and has pretty high ratings, but Nobody talks about it. I didn't even know that it existed until like a week ago. And don't even get me started on its live-action films. The Rise of Cobra was disappointing at best, and Retaliation and Snake Eyes, the most recent movie, were a critical failure and a box office bomb, respectively. I have a theory as to why. I think that it's because the G.I. Joe franchise can't make up its mind about what it's trying to be. It started out as a simple toy line for little boys, and then it became an intense, dramatic comic book series for older kids, teens, and adults. Is it action, or sci-fi, or fantasy? I don't know. G.I. Joe doesn't seem to know. On the one hand, it was meant to be super realistic, but in time it brought in characters and storylines, like with Globulus which I don't even know what that was supposed to be, or plot points of bringing some of the members back from the dead, or even crossovers with the Transformers. The cartoons were so simplistic that kids of all ages could understand and enjoy it, but then the live-action films tried to appeal to adult audiences by bringing in guy candy in the form of Shannon Tatum, and also touching on these dramatic, intense storylines, apparently, with the most recent movie, which has something to do with, like, blood ties to the Yakuza or something like that. I haven't seen it. I just read its blurb. What are you, G.I. Joe, though? What are you trying to be, actually? In trying to appeal to absolutely everyone, it shot itself in the foot. It seems like it's intent on sacrificing all of its charm to try and have more reach, but in doing so, it's disappointing to fans of the franchise and mediocre to everybody else. And so, no one cares. Not the kids, not the adults, not the fans, not the general public. No one, unfortunately. And that's sad. 
but it's just a theory, and I really do hope that I'm wrong. It could be that crappy marketing or incompetent writers or personnel are to blame for its failure to resonate with anybody, but we also have to consider that we are in the middle of a pandemic and now is probably not the best time to release anything to cinemas. And so this is where my new formula and video 3 come into play. See, I have a teeny weeny bit of a confession to make. I haven't actually watched the original series or Renegades, I haven't read most of the comic books, and also I haven't seen Retaliation or Snake Eyes. But I am going to now, because I have two objectives. Number one, I want to deep dive into this franchise that I have loved my whole life long, so that I can experience all the parts of it that are unfamiliar to me, and also re-experience the parts of it that I love the most for fun's sake. And also I want to take a critical look at it to try to get to the bottom of why this amazing, intricate, wonderful series continuously stands the test of time, yet simultaneously fails to hit the mark every time it tries to be great. But there's a lot to get through, so video 3 is gonna take a while to reach your eyeballs. I suppose you're just going to have to subscribe so that you know when I upload it. I'm just saying. So in summary, G.I. Joe is arguably a fantastic and important franchise. If it weren't, it wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar brand, and it wouldn't be in the Pop Culture Hall of Fame. But why is it great? Well, because it was intended to be. G.I. Joe was never an unlikely craze like Harry Potter or Pokemon. It was always a franchise that catered to what society was looking for. It was calculated from the very beginning, and its willingness to adjust to the changing times is what has kept it relevant for the last 57 years. And counting. That is impressive. Still, it could do and be better, and that's why I intend to investigate the matter further. And also because I love G.I. Joe and I want to watch all of it. So, on that note, let me know what you make of this franchise, and if or how it appeals to you, I would really love to know. I have a crap ton of media to get through now, so I am going to shut up and head out. I will see you sometime soon. Bye for now.